have received what Jesus talks about. Actually, John the Baptist says this about Jesus. He says, I'm going to baptize you with water, but one who is going to come after me is going to baptize you with fire. He says this in Matthew chapter 3. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29 says this, that our God is a consuming fire. And some of us have reserved the fervency and the fire of God for someone of a certain personality type. But listen, he is an all-consuming fire. It doesn't matter if you're an introvert or an extrovert or whatever. Listen, when you get consumed by the fire of God, things change in your life. And just like we were singing about this morning about that sacrifice, I want the Lord to burn up all of Josh Brown. I want to be, I, I want to be completely burned up. I, if he sees someone, I love, I love that song, man. I'm just like getting wrecked as I'm singing. I'm like, Lord, I want to be a sacrifice for you. I want to be a laid down lover. I want to be one who's just, who my life is just completely burned burning for God as a, as a fragrant offering to the Lord. And so when we talk about fire, we're not just talking about emotions. Come on, we love that. We love the emotions. We're not just talking about being fervent. But what we're talking about is this, I, this concept of fire throughout the scripture and how it's associated with sacrifice, specifically in the hands of the priests. And so, so if you know anything about the temple, we're not going to get way deep into it today, but, but the, the temple, before Jesus came and made us the temple, there was a temple, and in this temple there was worship going on, and fire was center stage. In fact, there was a fire that couldn't go out. It was the priest's job to make sure that they added to that fire every single day. Did you know that the Holy Spirit will light you up? But it's your job to keep the fire going. You can't just ask the Lord, oh, Lord, you got to keep the fire. You, listen, if you provide the sacrifice, he'll provide the fire. And so it's always our opportunity to partner with God and say, Lord, you need something to burn up? Burn me up. You can go ahead and have me have every, every part. And sometimes we like that when we're first in the Lord. We're like, we're total surrendered. We're totally on the altar. But we kind of get into this place where we start wanting to hold on to things a little bit and not really allow the Lord to have those. So I want to be a man that is like totally burning for God. And, I, and I've been burning for like 30 years and I hope to burn for the next 30. Come on. So Hebrews chapter seven, talking about priests. This is what it says. There were many priests under the old system for death prevented them from remaining in office. So they didn't serve like a four year term or a 10 year term. Whenever they signed up to be a priest, it was for their life. But they would die. And so a new priest would have to be uh, assigned to the temple. But because Jesus, get this, lives forever, his priesthood lives forever. <laughs> Isn't that good? Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever. We've shared on this recently. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. Jesus' purpose now is no longer to save humanity. He already did that. His purpose now, his mission now is to represent you before God. Your shame, your struggle, wherever you're at, Jesus is representing you before God. Before the throne of perfect justice. We love justice. Well, we like it for everyone else. But Jesus, listen, Jesus before the throne of perfect justice provides perfect mercy. Forever. He don't have to get back on the cross because you messed up. No, he remains forever that final sacrifice, the final priesthood before God and interceding, representing us before God forever. So you have two characters before the throne of God. One is the accuser of the brethren, Satan, who is before the throne of God accusing you. Every time you screw up, every time that you have a little bit of doubt, every time you give in a weakness, every time you give in a moment, he's going, look, Lord, they don't belong to you. And Jesus is going, hold on, I plead the blood. I represent them. They came through me. They are a child of God. The devil's going to come to you. He's going to say, that stuff wouldn't happen. But that stuff that happened at church wasn't real. And Jesus is going, they belong to me. Yeah. He's, he's forever representing you before the Father perfectly. 
He's, he's, he's the perfect sacrifice and he's the perfect intercessor. He is the kind of high priest we need, verse 26, because he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin. He has been set apart for sin, from sinners and has been given the highest place of honor in heaven. Unlike the other priests. Now, the other priests, they didn't just have to represent all the, all the people's sins, but their own sins. So every day they had to give a sacrifice for their own sin. This was just part of their duty. He does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this for their own sins first and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once and for all when he offered himself as a sacrifice for people's sins. Jesus only had to die one time for you. It was enough. Verse 28, the law appointed high priests who were limited by human weakness. But after the law was given, God appointed his son with an oath, and his son has been made the perfect high priest forever. This is why you don't need to go to someone when you sin to get to God. You don't have to go in a little closet and confess your sins to a person. There is you need relationships in your life where you're talking to people, but no one represents God to you once you come to Christ. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. Once you come to Christ, you have a direct line. He's on speed dial. You get full access to God. You don't have to go through penance. You don't have to go and sit before priests, set up a, a schedule, so you know, get, sign up an appointment so you can go and talk to the priest so you can get right with God. No, no, no. You're made right with God because of what Jesus did. When Jesus tore that veil, he gave you an all-access pass to heaven. Yes. Beloved, you don't need the pastor to pray for you. Come on. Nobody, nobody has a more direct line than you do. You have as much of a direct, I have people, pray for me, Pastor. I'm like, well, yes, I will. I'll pray for you. But are you praying for you? Because you have a direct line. And what I found is when you tap into that direct line, you will have to rely upon the intercession of others less. Because you have this confidence, and it talks about that, that we have confidence to approach God, that we can approach God boldly, that we can go before God and go, man, Lord, did you see what I was looking at? Did you see what I, he's like, yeah, I see. And you go, man, I blew it again, Lord. I need your strength. Here I am again, just laying my life down. And he's going, come on. I receive you. I receive you. So, so the role of a priest, this is important. This is important for you to remember for the rest of the message. A priest's role was to minister to the Lord on behalf of people. So Jesus his assignment now is just to represent you because of what he already did. He's, he's not paying more sacrifices. He's, he's already paid that. But he is the representative to you. You're, you have direct access to the Father because of what Jesus did. Jesus represented the Father, and he also represents you before God. Intercession, because we use that word a lot, just think of it this way, is representation. That's all intercession is. Intercession simply means that you're being represented in heaven. When we go to heaven, <laughs> we can represent ourselves, or we could represent what Christ did. So you don't get into heaven going, man, I did really good. If I asked you today, and I am asking you, if you were to stand before God, do you left this place and you died. And you're standing before God, and he says, why should I let you in heaven? What will your answer be? And most of us will say, I've been a good person. I tried my best. I went to church. I paid my tithe. I did my thing. But that is not the answer. The answer is Jesus. That's the answer. That's the, listen, that is the only credential you need to get to heaven is you go through Christ. You accept what he did. Jesus represents us forever. Intercession is representation. However, as we're in this series, the Holy Spirit is also an intercessor. We've talked about that word, right? The parakletos, the advocate. Some translations say that is, that is one 
who pleads another's case with one, an intercessor. So the Holy Spirit is also an intercessor. Jesus is an intercessor, so it's like we got to pray in God. Holy Spirit is an intercessor. Romans 8, verse 26. Y'all okay? I'm going to want to teach a bunch today. And the Holy Spirit, look, helps us in our weakness. Romans 8, 26. If there's one, if you said, man, I, I want to devote the rest of my year to one chapter in the Bible, what would it be? Romans 8. I call Romans 8 the victory discourse. Just read it. What do I read? Where do I start? Romans 8. Just read it. Okay, where do I go from there? Just read it again. <laughs> read it until you breed it, right? It's just let it, let it keep producing in your life. Get into the Word until the Word gets into you. I don't think that went over very well, Jen. Thank you. <laughs> Th- thanks for your laughs. I appreciate it. So, and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants to pray for, wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. So the indwelling spirit in you is groaning, is praying, is in a continual state of intercession. He's continually communicating with you the the heart and the thoughts of God. This is how you can, listen, you can't know God without the Holy Spirit. You've got to have the Holy Spirit. He prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. Some of us have tapped into that. You're praying and you're like, oh, I have words. You're aligning with the Holy Spirit. He's, that's what he's doing. He's just like, we're like, oh, okay. Well, we don't have words for it. He's got a word for it. And for us, it's just, oh, right? You ever do that? You're praying and you don't even have words? I mean, you're like really praying. And then like you're engaged and you're just like, oh, I do that all the time. I'm just noisy. And so I'll get before the Lord and I'll just make noises. He's like, what is that? I don't, I don't know. I just, there's just something that's felt, something that I'm experiencing that I'm just trying to get into language. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads with us believers in harmony with God's own will. How do you pray God's will? You pray in the Spirit. We're going to get into that. And we know that God causes everything. We love this verse. This is your Hobby Lobby verse of the day. We know that God causes everything to work together for the good that those who love Him and are called according to to the purposes, according to his purposes for them. We love that. We're like, that just means, you know, everything that happens in my life is God. That's not what that verse means. What that verse means is that God will take everything that is thrown at you in life, every difficulty, he will work a purpose in you. That purpose might not be to get a promotion. And that's what, that's what we do with that. Oh, he's working together his purposes. I'm about to get a promotion. Maybe you might get demoted. If it's his promotion, it might not be earth's promotion. Sometimes he will demote you so you go, oh, Lord, I do need you. And this is what it says he'll do. This is God's purpose. You want to know what God's purpose for you is? That you look more like Jesus. Look, for God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son. So what does that verse mean? That means through the spirit of God, whatever is thrown at me, God will make that make me look more like Jesus. So when someone's mean to you and you go, God works all things together for good. It loads the love of them. And you go, that's right. God's going to humble you and make you look more like Christ. Everything in your life is aimed, no matter, it might be aimed to destroy you, but God turns it and repurposes it to make you look more like Jesus. When your kid's waking up at three in the morning, that's what he's doing. He just wants to repurpose it. What, it, what, what someone else meant to do to annoy you, God is using to conform you to the image of Christ. He loves it. He loves making you look like Jesus. So the Spirit of God prays for us, groanings that cannot be expressed in word, but also the Spirit prays with us. Some of you have been praying like words on a, on a page. Some of those are really good. What we need to do is we need to start praying with the Holy Spirit or in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Ghost is the best prayer partner. So when you pray, and and many of us get in this place where we pray, we go, Lord, I don't know what to pray. I've heard this. I don't know how to pray. Sit before the Lord and ask the Lord, say, Lord, what do I need to pray about? 
and then sit there and listen, and the Holy Spirit will start showing you things. A lot of things are going to be your frustrations, your tensions, all, those kind of, all that stuff's going to come up. It's going to. But also, you'll start thinking about things you never thought about before. You're praying for people that you met on Sunday. You're like, oh, I forgot I told them I was going to pray for them. Or you put it on Facebook that you're going to pray for them when you forgot. By the way, posting praying for you doesn't mean you're actually praying. I think we got a lot of liars. I know you're being good intention. I don't need your thoughts. I don't need your happy. That's not what prayer is. Prayer is talking to God about it. So when we get before the Lord, we just need to ask him. The Holy Ghost is the best prayer partner. I just need a part prayer partner. You do. You need people that you'll pray with, but the Holy Ghost is the best one. Yeah. And what's crazy is you'll start talking to your earthly prayer partner, your friend. You'll start talking to them about what you're praying about, and they're like, I'm praying about the same thing. Why? Because you're both praying in the Spirit. So we pray by the Spirit, through the name of Jesus, to the Father. You can only pray because of what Jesus did. What is praying in the Spirit? All right, let me, let me give you three pieces here. Praying in the Spirit. First of all, praying in the Spirit is a personal prayer language. Some of you are like, what are you talking about? I'm talking about speaking in tongues, which I just lost half the audience. Because we were like, oh, that's... Listen, understand that everything in the kingdom is supernatural. You're not always going to... Sometimes you have to experience it, and then you can understand it. And so when we talk about a prayer language... We're talking about a language that God gives you to communicate with God that you have and nobody else has that. It's, it's kind of like code. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Leslie and I, when we were dating, we had these code words. Not, she doesn't want me to tell you the words. I'm not going to tell you the words. Because they're, they're just our words. You don't get access to those words. Just her and I know those words. Hey. So praying in tongues, typically, mostly, almost always, I would say, comes along with being baptized in the Holy Spirit. We see this throughout the book of Acts that most of the time when people were baptized in the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues. It's just what happened. You're like, well, I'm filled with the Spirit and I don't speak in tongues. How do you know? It's just a evidence. You say, well, I don't know, man. That's kind of, just pursue it. Paul says, pursue all the gifts especially that you prophesy, but pursue all the gifts. And so I, what, I, what I don't want you to do is I don't want you to disqualify you from a gift that God, God will give you. Listen, I pray in tongues every day. I've been praying in tongues every day for over 30 years. Since 1993, 31 years, I've been praying in tongues every single day. On July 4th, 1993, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I started speaking in tongues. I was like, what is happening? This is wild, but I was pursuing it for months. And ever since that day, if I'm discouraged, I pray in tongues. If I'm in the car, I pray in tongues. I turn the radio off, pray in tongues. This morning, we're praying in here, I'm praying in tongues. And my tongue doesn't sound like your tongue. It's just my tongue to God. So it's my personal prayer language. So it's a tool. Understand, we, sometimes we glorify tongues. But listen, and, and, and don't let this divide you. Search it out. Search it out in the scriptures. Um, when I was youth pastoring, let me share this. When I was youth pastoring in Mesquite, my, my first assignment as a youth pastor, I, uh, we, our kids, I wasn't able to go with them to camp because I was working at another camp, so they went to camp, and when they came back, the kids were like, oh, man, it was awesome. I was like, I was camp. I was at camp. That's awesome. They, were, they, would say, they said, I got my prayer language. That's what they said. I was like, okay, cool. You know what that means, right? That means like you were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They're like, I got my prayer language. That's, that's what they said. And, and they kind of used that language. I was like, you got more than that. It's like, it's like you got a car with tinted windows and you're driving around and you're going, I got tinted windows. I got tinted windows. Tinted windows are awesome. But you got way more. You got an engine. You got a machine. And you're sitting here bragging about the tinted windows. So I'm not undermining praying in tongues, but emphasizing praying in tongues is awesome. You definitely want those tinted windows in Texas. Right? Your vehicle's better with tinted windows. And you are better with having this accessory or this tool called praying in tongues. And so if you don't have that, then just ask the Lord 
to fill you with the Spirit. You say, oh, I'm already filled with the Spirit. All right. We're not going to get in an argument. Just ask the Lord to fill you with the Spirit and to ask Him to give you the gift of praying in tongues, which is different than the gift of speaking in tongues, and I'm not going to dig into all of that today. Paul says this, I thank God, 1 Corinthians 14, 8, 18, he says, I thank God that I pray in tongues or that I speak in tongues more than you all. So there was a, there was a little bit of a, not, not a braggadocious thing, but where he's saying, listen, I'm just grateful that I have this awesome communion gift with the Lord. And so it's more than, it's more than just gibberish. You're actually speaking the language of heaven. So he, he says this in 1 Corinthians 14, for if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying. But I don't understand what I'm saying. So when someone says, well, you got to have an interpretation. you got to know it's just gibberish. Paul said, if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying. One translation says, my mind is unfruitful. I don't really know what I'm praying. Well, then what shall I do? I should pray in the spirit. I also pray in words. I will sing in the spirit. I will also sing in words. So a lot of times I'll sing, you know, singing, singing in the spirit. What am I doing? I'm just communing with the Lord. I don't have words, but he's got those words and he's given me those words to talk to him. So it's this personal, private prayer language. There's a, um, a book that I read in 93, uh, a little, just a little bitty booklet. Any of you could read it. It'd be very easy to read. Uh, and it's called Why Tongues, and it's by Kenneth Hagin. You can scan that, or in your notes, there's a link there. It's, it's like a 10, 15-minute read. And I remember when I was really seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit, tongues was one of the things that really just, I mean, at our church, it was like, if you don't speak in tongues, like, you're barely saved. <laughs> and it was, it was highly emphasized. And I'm glad it was, because I was pursuing the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I read this little book, and it helped me a lot. So this, this it's a great little a little read on, on tongues, and if you kind of like, oh man, I don't really know, I'm not sure of that, then, then read that. I, I would love to give you that as a resource. I'm not, I'm not really giving to you. It's just, it's free on the internet, but I can show you where to get it. So, so the first thing is you get a personal prayer language. Number two, you get precision prayer. Precision prayer by praying in the Spirit. John 16, we've, we've used this verse several times in the series. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine, and this is why I said the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. So when we're praying in the Spirit, he's telling us what to pray. You can know by praying in the Spirit, you can pray the will of God. You're always praying the will of God when you're praying in the Spirit. I love it so much that any time that I'm like, Lord, I don't, I don't even know how to pray about this. Have you ever got that? Like someone's like, oh, I, I want you to pray. And you're like, well, I don't even know how to pray. Like, well, just pray in the Spirit. We, by praying in the Spirit, you are praying the will of God. His Spirit, with your Spirit, with Jesus. And you're just like, oh yeah, we're going. We're praying. And you're like, did you pray for me? Yeah, what did you pray? I don't know. I just, I just prayed in tongues the whole time. Number three, the, 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 the third benefit of praying in the Spirit is faith building. So G20 says this, build up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. So man, I, I just don't have faith for that. Pray in the Spirit. I'm having a hard time trusting God in this situation. Pray in the Spirit. I'm having a hard time getting out of this pit of depression. Pray in the Spirit. I'm having a hard time with creativity. Pray in the Spirit. Our, our, our pastor that we served under in El Paso, he knew that I had a, a side hustle, graphic design business. You need that when you're a youth pastor. And uh, and so he came in and he, he walked by my office and he, he went back and he poked his head in my office. He said, Josh, when you're la lacking creativity, just pray in the spirit. I never forgot that. My, as, a, as someone that did graphic design for the better part of two decades, when I would lack creativity, guess what I would do? i just pray in tongues. And the Lord would just start downloading creativity to me. Why? Because I'm just communing with the Lord. I don't know. It's creative. It's... You know, it's kind of out there. It's kind of abstract. Yeah, all those things are great. And it'll stir up that creativity. It'll stir up your faith. When you're really having a hard time trusting the Lord, just pray in tongues. Because really, in those moments, it's building your faith because you're using your faith. You're like, I don't know. I, is it just gibberish? No, it's not just gibberish. It's a language God gave you. So by even speaking that out, you're exercising faith. And you can only, you can only grow your faith if you're exercising your faith. So this is a real simple exercise that you can do to grow your faith. 
So, Paul also says this, when you speak in tongues, you edify yourself. And so it, it's important for the encouragement, for the well-being of our soul. Have you prayed? Have you prayed about it? Have you, have you been before the presence of the Holy Spirit with it? So when we pray in the Spirit, what happens is we align our spirit with His Spirit. It's, it's just like a, a synchronization that happens. You're just like, boop. Come on. What am I praying about? Boop. And you're, you're there. Love it. Look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. The person who is joined to the Lord is one with him in spirit. Beloved, stop seeing the Holy Spirit as someone who touches me during service. He does. But start seeing yourself as one who is one with the Spirit of God. You're one with the Spirit. He's not like coming and going. This is what happened in the Old Testament. He would come and go. They have purpose. Come and go. No, no, no. Be with the Lord. Be with the Lord. You are with the Lord. You're one with... If, when, once you come to Jesus, you're one with Him in spirit. This is why you trust Him. There's, there's, a, there's a blending. Come on, would you, would, you, would you start seeing yourself in this way? I'm one with the Lord in spirit. Then what happens is you begin to take on His nature. So holiness and the fruit of the Spirit, and all this kind of stuff, it doesn't happen because I'm so disciplined. No, I'm disciplined because I'm one with Him. Because self-discipline is a fruit of the Spirit. So what do I need to do? I need to commune with Him. I need to commune with the one I'm one with. It's like if you're having relational tension at home, you're disconnected from your spouse, what do you need to do? Go in the other room? Go to your parents' house? No, that would be the stupidest thing for you to do. The best thing for you to do is get together. Spend some time together. It's just the same way with the Lord. When we're feeling disconnected, when we're feeling drained, when we don't know what to pray, when we're feeling faithless, what do we need to do? Just go, Lord, I'm, I'm here, and I'll just talk to you. He's right there. You just breathe out. I can tell you how many times that I leave the church on a Sunday morning and exhaust it, and I just turn the radio off, and I just pray in tongues. And I'm just like, oh, Lord, I'm so tired. He's like, he's communing. We're just talking. So I, I want to shift gears for just a little bit. Because our union with the Holy Spirit involves an intercessory, I can't even say the word now, dynamic. So when you partner with the Holy Spirit, you become an intercessor. Yeah. And most of us are like, uh, not me. I don't really like to pray. <laughs> I mean, I have a hard time spending like 10 minutes with the Lord every day. Most of us. But listen, when we come to the Lord... He, and we're one with him, we start to take on those na the, the, the nature of that. And so we call this, if he's a priest, and he's an intercessor, and he's a representation, then, then we are brought into a priesthood with him. And this is exactly what First Peter says. You okay? Yeah. You all okay? We're, we're just teaching today. First Peter 2, verse 4, you are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. Who's the temple? Who's the temple? We are. We're the temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. So he's continually building you as the temple of God. What's more is you are his holy priests. Yeah. Through the mediation, the representation of Jesus, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. Nathan hit on this during worship. When we worship the Lord, when we offer sacrifices, when we're laid down lovers... When we're getting before the Lord, what's happening is we are producing an aroma, Scripture says. That we are producing an aroma that goes up to heaven and God is pleased. This was part of the role of the priests when they were burning sacrifice. God was going, oh, I love the way it smells. And when we're worshiping, and it says this in, in a Revelation chapter uh, 5, verse 8, it talks about, the bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, and then it talks about harps. So here they are before God. They're singing with harps. We would use guitars. That's the only harp I know how to play, only stringed instrument I know how to play. So I'm just, I'm singing prayers. I'm before the Lord. And it says that it's a pleasing incense to the Lord. So your prayers, your worship, we're like, whoa, 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 which one pleases the Lord? Yes, they both do. It's, it, the Lord's like, oh, I love it. Is it laying down our life? Yes, I love it, I love it. But it says this in, in Revelation 5, 8. It says 
that this, this pleases the Lord. The prayers, the offerings, the singing. This is why we sing before the Lord because we know that we, we don't do it so you come in and you like the music and you go, yeah, it's cool music. I'm going to keep going back. I like the band. Like I hope, I hope that's not what you experience here. Hopefully you come and you're like, man, they're just, they're going after the presence of the Lord. Why are we doing that? Because we, we are honoring the Lord. We're going, Lord, I love you. And he's going, oh, I love you too. He's, he enjoys it. And so when you're praying in the spirit, he's just like, oh, come on, let's go. Let's talk. And it just, it, it just brings a layer of pleasure to the Lord. You good? And we want to we bring the Lord pleasure, right? He's fully pleased in Christ, but whenever we worship, when we pray, it brings a layer of, of pleasure to the Lord. It's like, it's like we already got the ice cream and, the, and our worship is like, you know, it's like the, the syrup and the pecans. He's like, he's like we're, we're, we're giving, we're adding to what, to, to where the Lord is already pleased. He's like, oh yeah, come on, put something on it. And so we do. And then he continues in verse nine. You are a chosen people. This is a very familiar verse. You are a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. Then he makes a statement as a result, because you are that priesthood, you can show others the goodness of God. So there's this dynamic of intercession that I'm not just going before the Lord, but I'm also showing forth God's goodness. So intercession and representation is twofold. First of all, we have intercessory prayer, right? So intercessory prayer is where I'm praying for someone. Praying for yourself is an intercessory prayer. You're not representing anyone else. But when you're praying for lost people, listen, they can't, they, they're not, they haven't gone to Jesus yet. So until they go to Jesus, they don't have access. So you are a priest in that sense that you're going to the Lord because they can't go to the Lord on your own. You're going, Lord, I'm representing them. Their loss is a skunk. And here I am. I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, they need a job. They need that person out of their life. So we, you say, man, that's just not really my gift. So there was a woman in 2001, I went through a real difficult time, and, I, and I, the Lord laid on my heart to develop intercessors in my life. Remember this, Dad? And we, there was a woman in Odessa where I grew up, and we were living in El Paso. Her name was Del Talley. And Del Talley was an intercessor. Like, I know how to intercede, but she was an intercessor. And so I told my dad, and he's like, I was like, when I come into town, I want you to set up me a, a, a meeting with Del Talley. And so I go to, to Del Talley's house. It was this kind of old, random. I mean, it looked like, it looked like you stepped into the 70s. If, if, if she was alive today, she's with the Lord now. If she's alive today, it probably still looked like it was in the 70s. She drove this old, like, four-door, beat-up Nova. I mean, she, she was not in the best shape physically. And so we walk up to Del Talley's house. You remember this? We walk up to Del Talley's house. And my dad was like, listen, if you want to get the good guns, if you really want somebody interceding with you, you go to Del Talley. We just knew that. She was an intercessor. She had a gift for it. And so we go into Del Talley's house, and I, I sat down with her. I was like, Del, I was like, I would really love for you to be one of my intercessors, just someone that's praying for me frequently. And you need this in your life. Because I was, man, I was going through it. And she said, well. <laughs> it's just the sweetest old lady. She said, you know, she said, I pray all the time. She said, I pray when I'm doing the laundry. I pray when I'm driving the car. I pray when I'm doing the dishes. I pray when I'm doing the ironing. And the Lord told me, you need to stop praying on your feet, and you need to start praying on your knees. And I was like, dang. I'm like, man, I'm just doing good to, like, pray on my feet. And here's this woman that had a deep conviction to go before the throne of God every day as an intercessor for people that had trusted her with that gift. Now, let me say this. You might not be that. You might not be a Dale Talley where you have the gift of intercession, but we're all called to intercede. We all have this. It's just like everyone's not an evangelist, but we're all called to evangelize. We're not all prophets, but your sons and daughters would prophesy, eagerly desire that you may prophesy. All these things in scripture, you're not a prophet, but you can prophesy. Yeah. All, all, all prophesying is declaring the thoughts and intentions of God. Yeah. When you preach the word at work, you're being prophetic. Yeah. When you're praying in the spirit, you're being prophetic because you're communicating what God is saying. Yeah. doesn't mean you're a prophet. 
Prophets do that, but it doesn't make you a prophet. So it's our obligation with this connection of heaven that we have to intercede on the behalf of others. Sometimes we only pray for ourselves, And God is like, I want you to not just pray for others. and pray, I don't want you to just pray for yourself. I want you to pray for others. So that's one level of this representation, this intercession, is that we represent people to God. And the second area is that we have a partnership of being prophetic. And we just hit on this. A prophetic partnership is also representation. Did you know that you are the only Jesus that most people will ever see? Don't pray this. Lord, send somebody to them. If you prayed that, you're, the, you're that person. Welcome to the mission. Welcome to intercession. See, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit isn't simply to enhance our experience, but to empower our effectiveness. And we're like, I love the Holy Spirit. Run around the church. I'm like, it feels so good. It feels so good. It feels so good. And the Lord's like, I love it that you are experiencing joy. I love that you are experiencing the delight of heaven. Next week, we'll talk about the wine. We, we love that. But listen, the Lord is saying, it's not just about you being feeling good and you getting, being healthy in the Lord. It, he loves to do that. But he didn't come just to enhance your experience, but to maximize your effectiveness, to empower how effective you are. So when you preach the gospel, people get saved. When you lay hands on sick people, they get healed. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is partnering with you and you're doing his work on the earth. So I have this graphic I drew on my, uh, on my iPad last night. I know, just forgive me. My daughter would have done a lot, a lot better job. So here we are. This is the same person, by the way. There's two people. And there's this fire of, it looks like two people. It's one person just doing two different things. So we have this like priestly role where we're before the Lord and we're going, Jesus, we plead the blood. We declare Jesus. We're like before the Lord. And that's, maybe that's all you have to say. That's, that's the best thing you can say. Yeah. Jesus, we thank you, Lord. So we're, we're praying on behalf of people. We're saying, Jesus, do something. Do a work as intercessors. But then also as our intercessory role, as we have a prophetic role, we have a prophetic partnership where we're declaring the praises of him who called us out of darkness so that others may see his goodness, so that others may experience his light. You don't have to declare the future to be prophetic. All you have to do is communicate God's heart. That's all you have to do. So by... by preaching the gospel or by sharing the gospel, if you like that word a little better. You say, man, I, I just think that they'll see, they'll just see me be a good little person. You think you're that good? You're probably not because I've seen you and it isn't. And I'm like, sometimes I'm like, that person needs Jesus. Listen, a, a good lifestyle is critical, but that's not when, that's not when people, wins people to the Lord. That's not what wins people to the Lord. You know what gets people saved? Preaching the gospel. Declaring the gospel. Talking about Jesus. Talking about the gospel. You say, well, I don't know. I've seen how many? Read the book of Acts. Paul says this in Romans. He says, listen, how can they hear unless someone preaches to them? How can they know unless someone goes to them? Listen, it is our job and our obligation to represent Jesus to the masses. That's our job. That's our role. It's not just to get through this life because I'm, it's me and Jesus. We're good, dude. Great. I love that. He wants to, you to have all that, but he also wants to advance that to others. God is in charge of the product. The church, his church, is in charge of distribution. God only moves on the earth through his people. Oh, Lord, just get that person saved. Proclaim the gospel. You don't have to be annoying about it. Don't be annoying about it. Be winsome. Be smart. Be gentle. Be gracious. Have the character of Christ, not just the message. Come on. Allow the Holy Spirit to produce that work in your life. And then share the gospel. I've got one more story, and then we're going to finish up. In Exodus chapter, in Numbers, sorry, chapter 16, there's a story about the judgment of God. And it's pouring through the whole camp. And what it's for is they're complaining about God's leadership. 
And so they're complaining, and God's like, I'm done. I've had it. And he starts to wipe out the people. So Moses hits the ground with Aaron. Aaron is the high priest. Now Moses is a prophet, but he has a priestly accessibility. He's, he, he could still go before. Nobody else could. Only Moses could do that unless you were a priest. But Moses had a privilege of the priesthood. So Moses is laying down with Aaron, and he knows what it's going to take to, to stop the plague that's happening. So they're laying on the ground, and he looks over at Aaron, and he says, Aaron, go get the fire from the altar. So Aaron gets up, and he runs to the temple, and he presents the Lord a sacrifice. And he gets the fire, and he puts it in his censer, and he runs back to Moses. And he runs over and he's got it. And it says this in verse 48 of number 16. It says that he stood between the living and the dead. And the plague stopped. Can I tell you today, as God's people on the earth, as his priesthood on the earth, our job is to take the fire from heaven and stand between the living and the dead. Where we stand, the plague stops. Guess what? Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. We have Jesus. We have Jesus. We've re we're recipients of this beautiful grace. We're recipients of the fire of the Holy Spirit. And it's not just so we can run around in the temple and go, I have access to God. I have access to God. He's like, you sure do. Now go and stand between the living and the dead. What are you doing with this gift, beloved? What are we doing with this? Thank you for joining us at Overflow Church today. We hope that you were encouraged and encountered the reality of Jesus. If you did, please let us know in the comments. And make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss anything that we have coming up. Have a great day.